Thousands of years ago, a great ice sheet covered our area. When it melted, it left behind everything from bus-sized boulders to layers of fine clay. This history left a lot of sand and mud to erode from bluffs, wash down streams, and settle in pocket estuaries and bays. It's carried by water before settling out on beaches where currents come together and where the waves are seldom strong. These sand or mudflat beaches share a lot of beach life that can be found on the more cobbly or gravelly beaches. Boulders strewn about the beach will have barnacles, mussels, rockweed, and their associated community of snails, nudibranchs, algae, and more. You're likely to find a variety of the sea stars mentioned earlier. The sunflower star leaves a distinctive trail as the few lead legs drag the rest behind. Giant pink stars stretch their central tube feet up to 10 inches into a clam hole to latch on to prey. Also, look for moon snails on the hunt and clam holes or siphons. Unless you dig, you don't often encounter whole live clams. Most are buried and make holes in the beach so they can siphon seawater to filter feed. They live in the full range of beach habitats, but are particularly common and diverse in sand and gravel substrates. Though buried, clams give ample evidence of their existence, including shell remains, holes in the sand, siphons above the sand, and small fountains as they contract their neck and squirt the water out. Little neck clams are the steamer clams served in seafood restaurants. You are probably dining on accidentally introduced, but now economically important, manila clams, whose shells are slightly oblong compared to the more rounded shells of native little necks. The shell of a recently deceased varnish clam has a brilliant purple interior and shiny dark brown exterior. This clam was also accidentally introduced and is now regularly dined upon. This species was likely introduced by discharged ballast water from large ships in the late 1980s. Look for the siphon shows or shells of other clam species such as the butter clam with its thick black ligament between the shells, the pittock with its zebra striped neck and slightly separate siphons near the end the large gaper or horse clam with its rough pads next to the siphons, and similarly large gooey ducks with their long necks and smooth cream-colored siphon holes. The distinctive bent nose Macoma and the colorful Baltic Macoma clams have siphons that are separate instead of fused. Instead of filtering water, their incurrent siphon vacuums detritus off the beach. Oysters and mussels typically attach to hard surfaces. The small, native Olympia oysters and the large, introduced Pacific oyster cement themselves to whatever hard surfaces are available, but have an affinity for other oysters. These colonies create numerous crevices, a safe habitat for small invertebrates like worms, shrimp, barnacles, and even small sculpins. They're also fabulous with some butter, garlic, and a bit of white wine. On sandy and muddy beaches, the low tide often uncovers part of an eelgrass bed that thrives in the shallows. The earthly analog of this important habitat might be a prairie, which hosts a highly diverse community of plants and animals. An extensive root system anchors the eelgrass plants to the muddy bottom. Try to step around the exposed blades as you look closely for evidence of the life forms that depend on these extensive beds. For example, the wide lacuna snail lays a tiny donut-shaped white or yellow egg mass. Eelgrass also provides essential services to periodic passers-by. Point out that herring lay their eggs on eelgrass 
and that eelgrass provides an invertebrate feast for juvenile salmon. You'll likely see crabs, large and small, taking shelter among the blades. Submerged beds are havens for juvenile fish, small crabs, and many other creatures. One of the most diverse groups of critters living in the sand and mud flats are worms. Some of these worms have distinctive tubes that extend above the surface of the beach. We've got this one here with the folded over hood. Others leave distinctive piles of sand or mud around their hole. Volcanoes on the beach are the call sign of the oft maligned ghost shrimp. Like an earthworm, these unusual crustaceans eat sand and mud while they dig, and they are digging machines. They're an enemy of the oyster farmer, undermining the beds or covering the oysters in sediment. Sand dollars are a favorite on sandy beaches and live in beds hundreds of yards or even miles long. A sand dollar is basically a flattened sea urchin. It has tiny spines and a hard but easily crushed calcium shell. It can move on the surface of the sand and often burrows just under the surface when the tide is out. So tread lightly when you see evidence of these fascinating creatures. Mussels are familiar to most. They are very important marine filter feeders and a tasty treat for sea stars and for us. They are typically black in color, but you'll regularly find orange individuals mixed in. Mussels live on most hard surfaces, but along with barnacles are particularly characteristic of piling communities. A public dock provides the opportunity to do some belly biology. Docks are your chance to see beach organisms acting as they would when the tide is in and a lot of marine life that simply can't survive the tidal variations of a beach. Jellies live in the water column and for the most part are at the mercy of the currents, but they are often found washed up on beaches. Carlos, what is that? The harmless and common moon jellies have clear bodies, short tentacles, and gray to purple reproductive organs that are reminiscent of a four-leaf clover. The larger fried egg jelly is also safe to touch and is very aptly named. Its sting is so mild that other sea life use it as habitat. The lion's mane deserves a bit more caution. Like their anemone cousins, jellies use stinging cells called nematocysts to subdue their prey. The stinging cells of the large, red lion's mane jelly are potent enough to be very uncomfortable to our human. As with streams and rivers, fallen trees provide critical structure and habitat along marine shorelines. You happen to be walking on a place that has a tree down. It's a really neat place to observe different kinds of animals. Barnacles, and mussels will colonize these things heavily, and you can see just blocks of them uh, hanging on. And if some sort of wave energy or maybe a floating log comes and bashes these, they'll get knocked off. You can see something probably disturbed this area. And you get algae growing on it. And one of the really neat things is inside of this are a mollusk called the shipworm that is very actively boring through using its bivalve as more of a cutting tool than a protective shell to bore tunnels throughout this and eventually they'll degrade this thing to the point where it'll just collapse. Harvesting native and introduced marine life can be fun and nutritionally rewarding. Two things to remember before you hit the beach with a shovel are to check the regulations and check the health department's shellfish hotline. You can remind folks that refilling holes after you dig helps ensure you'll have more shellfish to dig in the future. The amazing animals, seaweeds, and habitats of marine waters, and our ability to responsibly enjoy them, face challenges from human activities in the watershed. Key habitats and species, such as kelp forests and native eelgrass beds, can be impacted by stormwater pollution, 
human alterations to shorelines, overwater structures, climate change, and invasive species. Globally, climate change threatens to increase water temperatures, storm intensity, and sea level. Such changes will encourage the spread of invasive species, decrease oxygen, increase acidity, and directly impact shoreline habitat. More acidic water could keep planktonic larvae from creating shells and settling to the sea floor. On an average day, 70 tons of toxic chemicals, including petroleum, copper, lead, zinc, and PCBs, enter the Puget Sound. Most of that enters through stormwater. The good news is that we can do something about stormwater and other threats. Maintain your vehicles. Use commercial car washes. Clean, inspect, and dry all your recreational equipment. Never release your aquarium pets or plants into the wild. Pick up after your dog. Use fertilizers and pesticides sparingly, or just use compost. Maintain your septic. Build a rain garden to let stormwater soak into the ground. Create a low-cost household cleaning kit. Report oil or other spills to your local jurisdiction. And perhaps most important, share these solutions and your passion for marine life with others. Well, that's a smattering of the life and lessons of Puget Sound shorelines. And we didn't even get to the birds and mammals. As a volunteer for the Kitsap Beach Naturalists, or for similar programs, you share a deeper appreciation for these remarkable resources. Thank you for bringing the lifestyles of fascinating marine creatures to the attention of Northwest residents and visitors, and for helping preserve and recover Puget Sound. Happy beach walking!